Here's part three of the presentation. In the previous part, I had just explained two Bayesian approaches to null value assessment using HDI and ROPE or using Bayes factors in Bayesian model comparison. Now we'll apply those two approaches to some sample data sets. Let's see what the Bayes factor does with a small effect size. Here are the data presented at the very beginning of the talk. Notice the p-value is far below 0.05, so we'd reject the null hypothesis according to frequentist criteria. The problem in that case was that despite the fact we rejected the null hypothesis, there was just a tiny effect. Well, what does the Bayes factor do? Well, it also rejects the null. Uh, here the Bayes factor is computed from a very handy uh, calculator provided at Jeff Router's website. Now if we do the HDI rope technique on these very same data, in the lower right we see an explicit posterior distribution on the effect size. We get this explicit estimate and we can see that there's a tiny effect size and even though the posterior distribution it seems to be off of zero. Compared to a modest rope, it overlaps the rope uh, quite extensively, and therefore we would not reject zero, because according to this definition of the rope, uh, most of the posterior distribution is practically equivalent to zero. Here's a new example. It has a small data set of just nine values, there's a very small effect size and a very wide confidence interval. What does a Bayes factor say about this? It accepts the null. It accepts the null. If we use the HDI and rope, again, the very same data, the bottom right sh shows this explicit estimate of the effect size. It says it's very small in magnitude, but it's hugely uncertain it doesn't come even remotely close to falling inside the rope. Therefore, we would not accept the null because we have such poor certainty in our estimate. Now, there are some desirable properties of the Bayes factor approach to null hypothesis testing. Uh, here, they're pointed out by Router et al. in a 2012 article about Bayes factors for analysis of variance. There's the uh, property of scale invariance, the property of consistency, and the property of being consistent in information. The HDI and rope decision rule also has those desirable properties. It has scale invariance, which means the posterior is the same for linear rescaling of the data. How is this achieved? Well, it's by using a scale and form prior. That is, the prior knows whether we're measuring on nanometers or light years. Consistency. This means that the decision rule gives the correct answer as the sample size n approaches infinity. Why does this happen for the HDI and rope decision rule? It's because the HDI falls correctly inside or outside the rope as n goes to infinity for any true value of the parameters. And the HDI and rope decision rule has consistency in information. This means that it gives the correct answer as the noise drops to zero for a fixed sample size. Why does this happen? Well, the HDI falls correctly inside or outside the rope as that noise goes to zero for any true value of the mean. In summary, there are these two Bayesian approaches to null value assessment. They're neither inherently paradoxical nor conflicting. They are different levels in a unified hierarchical model, as I diagrammed earlier. They pose the null assessment question different ways, hence they provide different information. The posterior on across models and decimal parameter versus a posterior on within model continuous parameter. These 
two different approaches require you to determine which is most relevant and informative for your application. If you believe that the null value is a truly viable description of your data and you really want to compare that against some alternative distribution on the parameter, then the Bayes factor approach is the way to go. But if you believe that the parameter is only going to be zero by infinitesimal chance and you're really trying to find out how big that parameter is even if it happens to be small well then the estimation approach is the way you want to go. So I've told you about three ways to reject or accept a null value. There was rejecting a null according to p-values in the frequentist tradition and there were the, the two Bayesian approaches to rejecting or accepting a null value. Now all of these methods have biased estimation when you conditionalize on rejecting or accepting the null. Here's a conjecture for any reject accept rule, whether it's p-value or base factor or HDI and rope or something else. The expected value of the estimate of theta given that you've rejected the null is more extreme than theta and the expected value of the estimate of theta given that you've accepted the null is less extreme than theta for non-null values of theta. In other words, your estimate is biased. Here's the intuition for why that happens when you have a fixed sample size. Well, those samples that happen to reject the null have more extreme data than samples that happen not to reject the null. This has been shown uh, many times. Uh, here, for example, Schmidt mentioned it in 1992 and Cohen recapitulated it in 94 and so on. But moreover, this is true not just for fixed n, it's also true for a very common way that people actually sample data, and that is sequential testing. Many researchers test sequentially with optional stopping. What you do is you collect some data, you test the data to see if you can reject or accept the null. If you can't yet reject or accept, well, you collect some more data, um, and you test again. Okay? A um, lot of people, a lot of researchers, uh, if you're getting close to rejecting or getting close to accepting, you'll try collecting some more data. Uh, now, this intuitively seems okay because subsequently obtained data are not affected by whether or not the previous data were tested. You know, consider flipping a coin. You flip the coin several times and you check, gee, can I reject the null hypothesis that the coin is fair? Yes or no? Well, now you flip the coin again. The next flip has, is completely uninfluenced by whether or not you test the coin before that. But that intuition misses the fact that stopping for extreme data precludes subsequent collection of compensating data. So you're going to stop once you collect something that's randomly extreme and you're never going to compensate after that. When you've stopped at reject, the estimate is biased to extreme. When you've stopped at accept, the estimate is biased to small. You can read more about this at the blog post. Here's an example of sequential testing of coin bias. Here the true underlying probability of getting heads is 0.5. I'm going to take you through these five graphs in order. Here I've plotted z over n, that's the number of heads z divided by the number of flips n, as a function of the number of flips, which goes on the horizontal axis from z zero, or actually one flip, out to 700 flips. The true value of theta is marked as the dashed line of 0.5, and you can see that after a few hundred flips, the sample proportion converges on the underlying probability. Here I've computed the p-value at every step in the sequence. This is the p-value conditional on the current n, the current number of flips. You can see that after, oh, about 30 flips or so, we get to p less than 0.05. The dashed line here is the 0.05 limit. 
So if we were going to stop when p gets to be less than 0.05, we would stop after about 30 flips, and we'd preclude the possibility of collecting more data that would compensate for those randomly extreme values. Here we see plotted the logarithm of the Bayes factor. It's plotted as a logarithm just so the uh, up and down directions of the scale are symmetric. The dashed lines show a Bayes factor of 3 and 1 third. I've plotted the Bayes factor at every step in the sequence. You can see that oh, after about 30 flips or so, the Bayes factor gets uh, above 3, or the log of 3, which means you reject the null. If you stopped there, you'd preclude the opportunity to collect compensating values. You can see that if you keep going, then eventually the Bayes factor drops down and does the right thing. It accepts the null eventually, and it stays there. Here we see plotted at each flip the 95% highest density interval on the posterior of theta. It's plotted as a vertical line at each step in the sequence. You can see that as you flip the coin more and more, the width of that HDI gets narrower and narrower. The dashed lines show a rope, a region of practical equivalence that goes from 0.45 to 0.55. You can see that early on, the HDI never goes beyond that rope. Eventually, after enough flips, the HDI falls within the rope and it correctly accepts the null hypothesis. The bottom graph simply plots the width of the HDI as a function of flip. The idea here is what you might do is simply flip until you get a desired degree of precision. That's the dashed line, and here we'd stop at uh, just shy of 600 flips. Here's another example in which the underlying bias of the coin is 0.65. This particular sequence of flips shows that eventually the proportion of heads in the sequence matches 0.65, the underlying probability of heads. Here is plotted the p-value at each step in the sequence of flips. Eventually the p-value drops below 0.05 and it correctly rejects the null. Here's the log of the Bayes factor. Early on, this particular sequence of flips happens to have about 50-50 heads, and the Bayes factor wants to accept the null early on. Eventually, with subsequent data, the Bayes factor correctly rejects the null. But if we had stopped at the first opportunity to accept or reject, here we would have accepted the null erroneously, according to the Bayes factor. Here we see plotted the 95% HDI as a function of the flip. Uh, eventually, the HDI gets narrow enough that it falls outside the rope, correctly rejecting the null. And at the bottom, again we see the width of the HDI getting smaller and smaller until eventually it would drop below the desired precision. Please proceed now to part four.